Hey everyone, my name is Peter. I'm the founder and CEO of Polywork. Polywork is a social network um, for people who polywork. Uh, and so what is polywork, polyworking? Um, polyworking is really the trend of people working in multiple ways at once. For example, you can have software engineers who have started a podcast or a YouTube channel. Maybe there's product designers who are working on side projects or angel investing. The reality is there are millions of categories of polywork and the trend has only accelerated in the last couple of years. And so the aim of this podcast is to really bring on exciting guests to talk about how they're doing that and really work out how they got started, um, how they you know manage their time and just talk through different bits and pieces, tips, advice on how you could all get started on polyworking as well. We started Polywork because we realized um, amongst ourselves and friends that really our professional identities had started to shift in the last number of years and that there was just a lack of solutions and social networks online that really allowed us to express the variety and breadth of things that we were up to. Traditional professional networks have focused predominantly around your identity as a singular job title. And so when us as a group were really working on side projects or podcasting or angel investing, um, that was sort of the first insight around this idea that people work in lots of different ways at once. And when we coined the term polywork, we realized that we, the more and more people we talked to resonated with it and that actually we wanted to go start the business to try to solve this, this problem of how do we help people represent themselves when they don't just work nine to five anymore? And furthermore, like how do we help connect people to new opportunities. Um, the reality is there are millions of ways that people can work, play, be on passion projects, um, and we wanted to enable that. What I'm really hoping is that if you are already doing some different types of work, poly work on the side, that um, you'll come check us out, check out the platform, um, or you'll be inspired by the guests that you'll hear on the show. And hopefully jump into the community and see um, who you might be able to connect with and, and start poly working with. And speaking of great guests, uh, our first ever guest is Sriram Krishnan uh, from Idrisen Horowitz, which is totally appropriate because he is the uh, the guy that got me into podcasting. Sriram uh, grew up in India, is now based in San Francisco. Um, like I mentioned, investing in Idrisen Horowitz, has had a tenured career um, as a product leader at Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook. Uh, you will also, of course, know him as the host of The Good Time Show, uh, the, uh, the famous show on Clubhouse that had Elon and Mark on there. Um, and in addition to that, uh, he serves a number of board seats. Um, he's a prolific online writer and, uh, unusually, which we're going to get into is signed to WME, the celebrity talent agency and, um, love the chat. Uh, I think one of the things we stood out the most was Sriram is a avid promoter of people getting themselves out there and content creation and attributes that to one of the reasons that he is where he is today, uh, which is totally appropriate because this is my first ever podcast getting myself out there on the content creation side. So I'm really excited to um, to show you guys the show. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you know, it's a, such a privilege and honor. And, uh, you know, on multiple levels, one to kind of just sort of work with you and poly work for, I think it's been a year. Uh, funny story, you know, you know, you know exactly a year. You know why? Because uh, we wound up uh, uh, well, Peter and I wound up actually you know, shaking hands virtually last year on Mother's Day. I know this because my wife, you know, pointed this out to me. That was a Sunday morning and we were like, well, we're going to go do this. And that meant I sort of disappeared from all of the Mother's Day obligations that I had. Uh, and uh, uh, Aarti is very happy that, you know, we wound up working together, but she hasn't totally forgotten about it. So, uh, which reminds yeah, yeah, me, it's yeah. been a year and, you know, it's been amazing kind of, you know, just to get to know you and see the amazing uh, progress that you folks have made at Polywork and yeah, really excited for this podcast. So yeah. Do you know what's crazy? It's a year to the exact day where we like officially launched our beta. Like we had like an alpha going for a couple of months before, but it's actually, I just checked, it's the 28th. It's actually, that's like a freaky coincidence. It's exactly a year to when we started asking and talking to some of our early users about, hey, would you, we're kind of, we think we're up for like a little bit of interest. Would you start, you know, talking to people about it, sharing, because before that we'd been very, we literally NDA'd early users coming in. I mean, that's just like years of paranoia from like a previous company. But yeah, I remember, I remember that Sunday. Well, it was so funny. We, we hadn't met, I think you DM, I think you DM me on Polywork and then maybe Scott Belsky also introduced us. It was like a double, it was a double whammy. It was a Sunday. Yep. 
I worked all the angles. So it's been a year and it's been such a rewarding, fantastic journey. And like, look how far you folks have come. It's my first consumer startup. And I feel like, I feel like that's a milestone. It's like, it. I thought B2B was hard. And then you do consumer and you realize that B2B, it's, it's not that B2B isn't hard, but mm -hmm. it's a little more predictable. It's a little more repeatable, the sales cycles, the quarter over quarter, you know, forecasts and predictions. Consumer is a beast. So what would you go say, tell B2B founders, you know, let's say you're building a SaaS company um, uh, and now trying to build something in the consumer world, uh, what piece of advice would you have for them? Find other stuff to do that regulates your sanity. It's where it's really important because it's about metric. It's a lot of, it's a lot more about um, someone talks about you one day, a metric goes up someone doesn't talk about you the next day, a metric goes down. And so it's until you really edge towards product market fit, it's a lot more volatile. It feels more, it feels like the roller coaster is more extreme, but so the highs are just so high, the lows are so low. And so I would say having some others, this stuff is great actually, because I get to like, I'm, it's been, I, I mean, I was super skeptical when you were first, like, maybe we want to do a podcast audience for the context. We really want to, build, you know, the the conversation around poly working and the trend. And I'm going to introduce Sri formally in a little bit. Um, but we sort of just like riff and then edit these in bits and pieces. But I was nervous about like, will I have time to do it? Because it's I mean, that is that is a theme to everyone that's poly working. Like, how do you do all this stuff with your nine to five, etc, which we'll we'll get into a lot today. But honestly, it's like, it's a brick. <laughs> it breaks it up and you get to hear like, perspectives that you just maybe wouldn't have. And so I would say actually, back to your question, routine, like having a routine of things that so you don't wake up and you're not checking Domo every morning, which has become my thing is I've now replaced that with like a 20, 20 kilometer cycle on my Peloton and still play basketball, like and just talking to other people, talking to other founders too. that has been the big actually the founder group that we have connected with Luba yesterday. Um, obviously, you know, Justine and the team from from Kindred and that's been great too, because you realize that they're all going through it, particularly during a pandemic and particularly with the rise of crypto and its impact on web too. So I would say just talk to other people and have a routine um, because there is less routine to consumer. Even the large consumer companies still have this. When I was at Twitter, uh, every and Twitter I think was particularly susceptible to this. Uh, there'd be every other week there would suddenly be a spike and right. we would go like, what the heck just happened? And it would be, you know, something happened to the world. Some there was a global sports event, which we knew about that, that we could predict. Uh, or there would be like somebody, you know, something had happened. You know, sometimes it was something tragic. Sometimes it was something awesome. Um, but something had happened. And, you know, what it would kind of drive a lot of the data scientists and engineers crazy because you're often trying to do experiments where you're trying to say, well, we did this and it had this amount of measurable impact and you're going to kind of separate right. out the noise and you're going to figure out in a statistic way what impact the changes I made had. That becomes a lot harder when every right. other week it's like, well, Elon tweeted something and so our numbers are through the roof and well, we got to restart everything from scratch. So there was a lot of that and uh, it, 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 even the big companies uh, do that. Uh, by the way, I really hear you on the, the routine part um, and the psychology. Uh, it's actually really true for VCs too. A lot of people ask me how it is to kind of move from a operator role to a VC role. Uh, and I think the, one of the biggest switches you have to make is when you're investing, you know, my job isn't to actually do product anymore. It's to, you know, try and be helpful to amazing founders like yourself. Uh, the flip side of that is you don't have actual agency. You can't actually do right. the thing. You are supporting the person doing the thing and trying to be helpful. Um, and so you kind of have to get used to the idea of like not being in control and sometimes even not knowing whether something you did, um, you know, is going to have an impact or not. Literally this week, last two weeks, and it's funny, this has all come full circle that we're speaking a year later, but some of our, I mean, as you know, you get spikes, they go up, they go down. And I, I you know, WhatsApp to you earlier saying for the first time, some of our like two particularly leading indicators are high, higher level of engagement than they were during the most paramount hype months. And so we're trying to break it down as a team and work out like grit, like what's mm -hmm. repeatable, like how do we do this, like continue whatever we just had a um, an amazing month. But a lot of it 
was the tailwind from this buzz, which we were also talking about, which is, well, people might try and leave Twitter. They're talking about leaving Twitter for like the next, like, you know, for the last five minutes, it probably won't last very long, but is it like, well, did we get a tailwind from that or was it actually our work? And we've managed to separate it out a little bit, but it is stressful. I didn't, never thought about like the VC stuff too, like the, on the, on the going operator turn VC, it's like, you have to advise and push and assess and insight and give insights, but you can't really, you can't really jump in, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's a difference between <laughs> being a coach and a player. It's not like Steve right. Kirk can be like, well, you know what, I'm going to suit up and get in there and, you know, jack up some threes, right? Which like, I would love to see. I would love to see. That, that, that'd be quite the game. moment. He's like, well, Steph, let me show you how it's done. Uh, uh, and so you have to get used to the idea. And it's, it's amazing if you can actually get, you know, get around the psychology of it, but you have to, embrace being a coach being a supporter being a fan um and being a buffer right sometimes i think startups are so hard uh they're really high highs and they're really low lows and right. i often think of my job and this is not original somebody else once said this to me i often think of my job as you kind of like dampen the waveforms on both sides which is uh like and you might have experienced some of this for me which is sometimes when something seems absolutely awesome you're trying to be like well okay that's great but you know like this may not last or something else may happen on the other hand, you know, if something is not going right and with startups, there's always something which is not going right. Um, you know, trying to, you know, trying to talk about, well, all the ways that, you know, uh, all the ways out of it or trying to kind of like just kind of cheer someone up. You often, often try to kind of dampen the waveforms is how I think about it. Be a shock absorber in both directions. It's funny. Joel Flory, of course, runs Visco that we both, both, both know well. He talked to me a lot about, about that, recommended some podcasts and sort of, and also, as I said, the, the true north, just like, just have it if you don't have it on a slide or you don't have it on a post-it note at the end of the day it's going to come all everything you do every day is going to come on so don't let a single day like you have to constantly zoom out so i literally have it here um on a couple of notes just like okay well we're still going there just because someone talked about us or 14 people or maybe it's we go viral and it's 700 people talk about us it didn't change the mission i mean one thing i've noticed recently the sheer volume and velocity of projects has made it really hard to apply i think traditional systems to looking at startups or looking at founders like how, how have you been approached you're th three months in now to yep. pure pure crypto yep how has that been going uh, great i would say uh i think there's a couple of things first is it's just a privilege right like imagine being in a world where nobody's actually working on anything interesting that would be a terrible problem to have this is what somebody would call a champagne problem right there are amazing founders there are too many amazing founders building too many amazing companies like woe is me like so first of all we're just so privileged and lucky to be in something like this uh uh you know as opposed to you know i've seen other industries where you, know, you just wait around and there's nobody building anything interesting and you could wait around for a lot forever uh in space i'm lucky to be in uh, and we are lucky to be in there's always somebody building something interesting so it's such a privilege and it's a very unique moment in time and i don't take it for granted i think the second thing i would say is i we have an amazing team uh we have a team of about 60 people here at a6 and the crypto and uh, it's impossible for any one person to go meet every single founder to be the expert in every single topic so we really kind of we really divide and conquer uh my partner uh ali yahya for example is one of the smartest people on infrastructure in crypto some of these deep technical topics uh you know think about any l1 l2 chain and he knows them all knows how it all works and he's quite the expert on that uh, i tend to focus more on some of the app layer uh, type projects, things in NFT land, or uh, things which are more about trying to bring Web2 into Web3. So I would say it's a huge team, we divide and conquer, uh, and you almost have to trust the team around you. Uh, but it, it is a lot, it's definitely a lot more than uh, other spaces, but who knows how long this will last, and I'm just very excited to just be here at the moment, because I know these things don't uh, wind up being last, uh, don't wind up lasting. How do you think about the teams and the founders though? Because I mean, like, for example, like in, in, even in a hot round on web too, like if, and particularly, I mean, like Polywork had its viral moment, which obviously helps during fundraising. But I feel like there's a lot of that in particular due to sometimes like there's a token drop or it's a really high quality team with like what Kevin Rose is doing with Proof, for example. Like, is it similar to how you assessed web too? Or is it different just given like the amount of creators in the space? Good question. I think there are some things that are similar, a lot that are similar and some that are different. Uh, I think the things which are very similar are you, you're trying to back, uh, you know, amazing, motivated founders uh, who have a grand vision, uh, um, you know, and have a market that they want to go uh, go after and are either capable or shown the tracker of building something amazing. Uh, 
Um, and that hasn't changed. And, and I think, so for example, like, you know, it, when you meet an amazing founder in any category, you can often tell very quickly that this person is special. They have a track record of doing so. They have a track record of attracting amazing talent. They have a track record of building interesting things. It just really pops. Even if it hasn't been in web, they haven't been building it because they can't have been building in web three for that long. Like, it, I don't think that's necessary because I think if you are, I, I think I'll get to that, but I think it's somewhat fungible where if you are capable in one space, you can probably take it over to another space. So that's, I think, so amazing founders, I think are very similar. What is different, uh, I think in web three is the background, some of these founders tend to look very different. Uh, uh, you know, for example, being crypto native, uh, you know, uh, it's a very different community, uh, and uh, you know, people have spent many, many years in it. So it may not be, say, the classic, you know, ex Google engineer who's trying to build a company. Right. So there's obviously several of those. So, so you kind of get different signals. Uh, so, for example, instead of say, hey, has this person built a well-known company you're looking for has this person built a community and they're very well respected in the community um, so they're kind of different signals you're looking for uh, one thing which has been interesting for me of late is i think there have been multiple eras of crypto uh, so satoshi writes uh, the bitcoin white paper i would say in 2009 or 2008 i believe um and you know and i think the first few years not super well known 2013 2014 bitcoin takes off and you know the ethereum white paper happens. Um, and I think that's when I think I got really interested because Ethereum was like, well, here's a global computer that anybody can program on. Uh, and then, you know, that brought in like a whole set of new developers. Then you had the ICO era, then you had the summer of DeFi. But I think what's really interesting the last couple of years is in the beginning of, say, we're in 2022, beginning of 2021 is I, you saw the explosion of NFTs and DAOs. Um, um, and, uh, you know, and you saw everyone from people to all these, to a lot of PFP projects, punks really took off, board apes happened, you know, um, you know, so many different things happened in NFTs. And I think a couple of the interesting things happened because of that. The first is it unlocked new kinds of talent and people to now come into Web3. We got artists, we got right. community managers, um, you know, we got people from very diverse communities uh, who weren't tr traditionally either into trading or went in, into infrastructure. So you got like very different kinds of people come into Web3, which I think is very intriguing. I think the second thing which wound up happening is as Web, Web3 and crypto climb the app layer stack, uh, you saw people like me, um, not VCs, but people who are in product roles in fan companies or Web2, designers, product managers, generalist product engineers, who, you know, who weren't really interested in infrastructure or some right. of the finance parts of it, but were really interested in consumer applications, who were really interested in community, who are really interested in, well, what happens if I sign it with my wallet? And so it's gotten a whole new set of talent in. Uh, even in the last few months, uh, several of the companies that I wound up working with have been people who have come from a Web2 background. Like they work for companies that you and I would be very familiar with that uh, we, uh, we use every single day. And I think that's a very interesting new kind of talent now coming in. And I, I expect that to continue. It's like my last company was almost in like the vendor, like the talent management space. And it was, it was interesting enough, but I mean, it was definitely more attractive to go work at like a web two consumer company. And so I think people are seeing how it actually, I mean, even me, like how it actually impacts their lives yep. and they can actually partake in it. Whereas it's much harder to get excited. I think in general about infrastructure, usually much, usually a lot of money in infrastructure and the more like web to like B2B boring software, as they say, like there's a lot of money in that. But I think people just saw how it could actually impact them day to day. Just I think there's a few reasons why it's attracting people. And I want to tie this to polyworking too. Um, you know, the first one is it's just a new design canvas. You know, it's unexplored. You know, it's it's like, you know, trying to find, you know, you found California like 200 years ago, right? And it's unexplored territory. And often the design problems are hard and unsolved. And if you're a builder, that's just fun. That's like, like golden, right? So that's one. I think there's a second part of it, which is, uh, and you know we've spoken about this a lot on other podcasts and so on but the internet was not meant to be controlled by a few large platforms it wasn't meant to be controlled by you know the facebooks and the instagrams and the linkedins uh you know of the world and i do think there is a set of people and by those companies are amazing i've spent a lot of years working those companies but i do think the set of people who want to see alternatives to some of these large platforms and i think that's really motivating people i think the third part of it uh you know i do think there's something really uh, look i i want to Actually, I want to tie this to poly working a little bit, right? I grew up in an era where the idea, in my professionally, where the idea was you do one job and that was your identity. You know, but my dad spent 
uh, I don't think I ever talked about this publicly, but my dad spent his pretty much his entire career in one company uh, in India. You know, starting, same same starting, here, 35 years in Belfast and working as a social worker. Yeah, when he was in his 20s, I believe, and all the way till he uh, retired in his 60s. And when I was a kid, I have this distinct memory, right? Like all of us probably do, which is you'd go to work in the morning with this kind of briefcase and papers, right. and then, you know, you'd come back. And, you know, and then he finished 40 years of it and then collected his pension. And that was the life, right? That was his identity, right? And the idea, and he slowly kind of like worked his way up that uh, corporate ladder. Uh, and when I joined Microsoft, that was the idea too. I'll never forget, like when I joined Microsoft, you know, my first year, uh, there was a very senior Microsoft exec who came and did a talk to all the newbies who just joined of undergrad. And he, I, he said something like, for you, any one of, he looked at he said, for any one of you college grads, to be taken seriously in this team, it's going to take at least five years before we take any of you seriously. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like five years is a very long time. Uh, like, right. you know, uh, and so, and and as I kind of went, grew up in Microsoft, right? I was always the guy who was a little bit out there. You know, uh, I would tweet, I would write blog posts, and I think it was always slightly frowned upon, where totally. people would go, well. Sriram, like, and I was actually very, I like to think I was very good at my job, right? I was at least reasonable at my job. You know, um, I was I was doing everything that expected me in my primary profession. But I think there was this slight amount of grumpiness about, hey, this guy should be doing this role. What is all this other stuff? It's a distraction. Lit, 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 so literally, so I worked at Google in 2000, up until end of 2014 when I started my first company. So two years there. And they had they 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 made famous the twenty percent project, and so I was a designer in a in one of the studios in London, UK, and I remember um, you had office hours. I, I I did it with Google Campus. It was like the kind of like if Google Campus. It was before Google Ventures was in Europe, so it was like how to work with startups. And I remember we had a resource manager in the studio, and he saw this block booking in my calendar on a Tuesday, and it was just the entire office. I was only twenty minutes in the office hour slot, but I was called out and reported for having this five hour block on a Tuesday on my calendar. They were like, why Why are you spending time at, in East London at you know, an old street at Google campus for five hours? Like, no, I'm 20 minutes at that. And it's actually a dial-in over Google Hangouts. And it was just like, yep. just parallel. Like, it, and, it, and it's crazy because a lot of the great, this is what's, I mean, it's tied to the polywork thing, right? Like the, the projects come from, a lot of great products came from the 20% yes. project or come from, like I listened to your um, podcast with Justin Khan a while a while ago, and you know you said about if you just write good, if you put writing out there, good things will happen, and that's literally why I'm an entrepreneur today. Is because I worked on the twenty percent project, saw these amazing entrepreneurs at Google Campus, and was like, I want to be like that. That's awesome. So I, I think I want to kind of address like two kinds of people are probably going to be listening to this, right? The first is if you're listening and you're active on social media or you have a GitHub repo that you're very active on, you're doing a podcast. Let me say. Go do more of it because, you know, my wife and I, you know, Aarti and I talk about this a lot. We followed our instincts on being more active on social and, you know, putting ourselves out there. And that has been so rewarding to us both personally and professionally. Pretty much every job I've had, including this one, has happened because of some extent because of my social media presence or because of my writing. Um, uh, it turns out when you write online, people find you and, you know, it, it, and amazing people find you and that leads to good things over time. So uh, if, if you're doing this and I be, but both my wife and I took a lot of criticism across a lot of jobs uh, uh, for being on social, not because we weren't good at a primary job. We were always, I think we did a good job at a primary job, but because it was not expected, it was slightly frowned right. upon. Um, and uh, so, if, so if you're listening to this, and you're a product manager or designer or marketer, and you're worried about somebody being grumpy at you, just ignore them, more power to you. Now, there's another angle to this, which is if you're an employer, right? And I think there is a school of thought, which goes, is this thing a distraction, right? Uh, is this thing that they're doing actually not their primary job? Okay. Shouldn't they be focused completely 100% on the nine to five at Microsoft? Exactly. Yes. And I think the second part of it is, I, I would say the underlying tension there is, is it somehow a bit, selfish like are you doing this because you want more opportunities as opposed to the company which is paying your paycheck wanting to you know get more opportunities and i want to i think they're both like valid questions and i think you know uh, i kind of want to respond to that so on the first one i think there's a few things number one is 
the way you should be measuring people is not on how they spend their time. You should be measuring them on, you know, what they actually wind up accomplishing. For example, if my in my job now, if I spend two years and I wind up making no investments with amazing companies, I'll probably get fired. Even if I was spending like nine to six p.m. at the offices, which I don't, and you know, um, and uh, because that's the job. The job is to actually produce amazing, you know, uh, partnerships with companies, right? So I would say you should be measuring employ uh, people that you work with on what they output, as opposed to how they uh, spend their time. So if they're not focused, that should not be a conversation based on how much they're tweeting or posting on Instagram. It should be a conversation based on I expected X and Y of you, you didn't deliver. Right. If you're delivering on X and Y, who cares whether they are tweeting, whether they're at the gym, whether they are like taking music lessons, it doesn't really matter. So I don't think that's the right answer. I think on the selfish aspect, um, I would say that requires a change in thinking to a growth mindset because when people go put themselves online, I think they're doing a few things. One, they're better, becoming better. They're being sort of these quasi brand ambassadors for the institution. Totally. They're going to attract talent, uh, you know, who also going to resonate with them and they're going to personally grow and you want your, uh, you want your employees to personally grow as well. Um, and so I kind of think that the old school mindset of you do this nine to six, it's your sole identity, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a closed mindset. And I would highly recommend people to go, well, you want to deliver, you are, you hold people accountable for things you're supposed to deliver, no questions. But beyond that, uh, let people explore all the other facets of their identity. Because one of the things I realized was I kind of like writing, I kind of like talking to about things in broad public, even though I was a product manager. And that led to so many career opportunities. It led to my clubhouse show, it led to this job in some ways, and led to so many interesting opportunities. Um, and I think it's incorrect to box people into you are an engineer, you are a designer. The more you let them explore, you know, they could be an amazing mentor. They could be, uh, uh, maybe they like to angel invest on the side. Maybe they like to do podcasting on the side. They're going to, you know, develop as a human being. They're going to develop as an employee. And, you know, and I think that is going to actually bring a lot of benefits to you as well. So that's kind of my mini speech on this topic. You're, you could sell us better, better than I can. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's funny, like the, it reminds me of the first vertical that we got the most traction in, which was developer advocates. And it's such a it's such an interesting thing because obviously like their job is quite literally to like they're they're let's say a developer advocate at Google. And their but their their job is quite literally to publish content for the community and engage the community. But their own brand is being elevated. They're they're at the center mm -hmm. of that podcast they're hosting, the open source project they're working on, like the whatever the, the YouTube channel, right? Mm -hmm. And that it's funny that I think I want to touch on what you said about the right, like, uh, I, it's, it's made me want to find more time. I mean, I'm still trying to find my time between finding and podcasting and, and writing, but I want to write more because um, it's also therapeutic. I love it. It's like actually more like an internal, like I, I'm, I'm going to, if if, you, if I get it out onto paper, then it's not in here. And so I love that part, but I think content creation, I know that some people don't really like that, that word. I was talking to Brian Levin, a um, pretty, pretty senior designer at GitHub ex-founder, angel investor, like polyworking, just totally killing it, works on a lot of side projects. And he's like, I don't like the term content content creator, but I but I would what we see, particularly what we see in our data or our platform, some type of content creation is the bridge to polyworking because it is naturally the thing that promotes professionals. And it so it doesn't matter what type, whether you are on a podcast or you're starting a blog or it it ultimately leads to exposure which then leads like Packy McCormick, you know, you know, great investor in Polywork, advising in recent, like start, like I read the article the other day about how his first 56 articles or something got him a thousand subscribers. And then after that point, it was, I mean, look what he's built off of that. And he's, you know, just hired his brother and is going on to build a media empire. But I think content creation, finding whatever that is, is the layer that brings the new Polyworking opportunities. Absolutely. I think Gary Vee has a good Talk on this. I think so. A few things about content creation. The first one is when you write or or speak, it really helps you sharpen your ideas and thinking. Um, you know, whenever you write something, uh, whenever I've written something, it's helped me sharpen my thoughts on the topic. So one is it's just going to act as a great mental instrument. That's number one. Uh, the second thing is when you put out content online, amazing people find you. Right? you I mean, you'd be amazed at how many times I've had somebody talk to me about something I've written, something which is not great at all, but they would find it and they'd talk to me because people are trying to find other people like them online. So that's two. I think the hardest part for people on content is just getting started. A lot of people know that my wife and I do this show uh, on audio, uh, uh, um, um, which has had like a lot of people on. And the truth is I actually, uh, this is my wife's idea. 
And I absolutely refused to do it because I hated the sound of my voice. I said, I, I, what did I say? I was trying to pitch you on letting me hire a host to do this because I hit my Northern Irish accent. Well, same <laughs> I don't thing. hit I know it, I, but I just I, don't I, like I, hearing I'll myself. Super, I, I'll be super vulnerable, right? I was like, I was like, I speak too fast. I have an Indian accent. I like writing. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to do audio. And I would, in the early days of Clubhouse, I would, when somebody would get me on stage as a speaker, I'd be like, ah, oh my gosh, I don't want to say anything. Uh, but it was my wife who actually sort of slash half convinced, half forced me to do this. And she was like, look, it'll be fine. It'll work out. And the thing that you realize very quickly is, uh, you know, very quickly you can build muscles on actually any new medium. Uh, and the second part, which are your, what is amazing about content creation is when you connect with somebody, right? One of the best things about doing anything, you know, maybe including this very podcast is when somebody else listens to it and maybe a month later, a year later, they say, hey, I listened to you when you said that, right. right? And, you know, I have something similar or it meant something to me or because of that, I did something. That is the best. And that happens all the time, the moment you write anything online. And I think people don't, one of the tragedies I think is people never get to experience that feeling when you walk into somebody on the street or when somebody tweets you saying like, I listened to your stuff or radio stuff. It had such an impact on me because that is such an amazing, amazing right. uh, 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 feeling. So when I talk, talk to people about content, I say, you know, just get started. I think the biggest challenge for people is they don't get started. They think a lot. They think about, oh, am I going to look stupid? Or, you know, do I look dumb to my peers? You know, do I have anything interesting to say? You'd be surprised how often that stops people. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so the other trick, not trick, the other thing I've learned is you have to get over the fear of how you might look to your peers. Because the things which seem obvious to, you know, your crowd or your colleagues or you, are not going to be obvious at all to anybody who's not in your industry or who's not in your sphere. I'll give you an example. Probably my the most successful tweet or blog post I have written in the last few years is how do you send a cold email? And I, I, that post is not going to impress anybody in the tech <laughs> VC world by right. you know by by its like high quality intellectual content, right? Like that's right. not. But there are probably hundreds of conversations I've had with people because, because of the very of post, right? So I, and I think you kind of have to get, you're like, you're like, well, I know this thing, but it's not common to obviously a lot of other people. And everybody has something, right? If you're working in a job, it's your life experience. It's your, uh, even life experience outside of your job. You know, people are interesting. And so I just, just get started, put yourself out there, write, you know, video, audio, whatever it is, you feel comfortable with the experiment with it all and good things will happen. I love it. It reminds me of, I think it was maybe like two months ago, we caught each other on WhatsApp on like a Saturday morning. And you're like, you need to, like, how's the podcast coming along? You need to tweet more, though, too. I'm going to connect you to some people. And I was like, okay, let me have a think about what I literally, my, my I default, I think I default to, like, the more, like, well, how do I sound intellectual about whatever topic it is? And you're like, no, 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 send the tweet now. Like, come jump back into the WhatsApp channel after you've sent the tweet. And I sent the tweet. And I got some followers. I had some conversations. And I've been trying to do it a couple of times. I need to get better at it. But I... Yeah, it is that element of, I think sometimes I see threads, like well thought out threads. And I'm like, my God, how long does that stuff take to write for these people? Because, or but, or maybe it's just you, you get those muscles and it becomes more natural. Because if you get me talking about professional identity, I will, I could write for anything. It's very much a muscle. Um, I, I do this talk inside A16Z, A16Z now on how to tweet. And, uh, uh, and I've seen people who had no Twitter presence and who used to be terrified about tweeting um, get really, really good at Twitter because Twitter is kind of a medium, right? It's an audience. You have to understand the vibe. You have to understand like right. the mechanics of it. Uh, and it's terrifying when you start, not just Twitter, it could be Instagram, could be YouTube. It's terrifying. You're worried, like, how do I look? Do it sounds dumb? Am I going to get fired? Uh, you know, like every day that somebody gets in trouble on Twitter and you, you have to look, work up to it. You need a supportive community of people uh, who can uh, help you. But if somebody's listening to this, I would say, just get started, tweet what you know, find, you know, engage in conversation with people who, you know, who are similar to you or who are your friends and good things will happen. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to, I did it. I'm going to do it more. It's fine. I literally tweeted yesterday about um, looking for product designers who angel invest. And I continue to be surprised that the, the sheer amount got like, 12, 13 DMs, like 30, 40 replies on like the comments about people who volunteer. And it's like, I, I often end up surprised with the amount of people that are willing to engage. I gotta, I gotta get, I gotta get a lot better at that. Um, I want to ask you about 
WME. So the simulation is getting kind of weird in 2022. You're now in crypto. Yep. I know we skipped a couple of chapters. We've been talking about a lot of stuff, but um, you're now exclusively in crypto and you and your wife, Arthi, are literally represented by WME, mm -hmm. Ari Emanuel's agency, if I'm yep. correct, right? How did that happen? And I mean, it's, I mean, and I, I want to recap a little bit and want to give you a chance to also tell some of the other parts of the story because listening to some of the other podcasts and having known you now for a year, I mean, your career from growing up in India to Microsoft to Facebook to the Clubhouse show to Elon to Andreessen. I mean, it, well, first of all, I, it, I think it, I get why when we met and you'd sp seen the time I had spent in the professional identity space, you got the polywork thing immediately. Like this is, this is the future of professional identity. People will not want to are not going to want to work nine to five. Just talk to me a little bit. Like, how does that how how does that happen? How do you end up represented by a celebrity talent agency when from from where you started? That's just kind of crazy, right? Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, uh, I wish it was kind of a linear way to tell this story. I think it's sort of a series of things which we were lucky and got into. So I would say that's kind of a broad framing is my wife and I. Technology has been probably one of the most positive things that have happened to us. Like if it wasn't for technology, we wouldn't have met. I think you might know the story. Like we actually met online over Yahoo Messenger about 20 years ago now. And uh, we wouldn't have had the careers we've had. You know, we wouldn't have had, you know, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of the resources we have. So pretty much a lot of the good things that have happened to us have been because of technology. And I would say as it went up, kind of went up the corporate ladder, um, I wanted to find a way to talk about the positive arc of technology because I, we, we can spend a lot of time talking about it because you know i would say that has been you know i think there's a broad set of people you know who don't think that technology is positive and you know we can have a conversation about that but i felt like my job and my wife felt like you know hey technology has been so good to us personally that we should talk about founders who are building amazing things and technology building amazing things so in fact the, the motivation behind i would say the show that we started doing on clubhouse was very much this which is having friendly positive conversation with amazing builders uh you know starting with elon to zuckerberg and and that was kind of the arc um and i think what just wound up happening is that that just somehow connected with people and some of these things are beyond anyone's control or anyone's able to explain. So I can't totally explain it, but it just took off. It turns out that there is a huge audience for people who really want to hear from founders, um, you know, from, you know, people building things and, they, and they're optimistic, right? Uh, they're not skeptical. They're not pessimistic. They don't think, you know, we are going to live in a dystopian future. They want to know how cool stuff is built. They think building, you know, companies is, amazing and interesting and noble endeavor and they're very optimistic about uh, uh technology and when we did that I, honestly we, you know i wish i could tell you that do some sort of strategy or carefully thought of plan or report it wasn't right we did the elon thing and it exploded and we had all these founders and you know elon is famous but we had all a lot of these lesser known founders and you get like people be like oh my god this person is awesome and it inspired me so something about that really connected with people and so what wound up happening is, uh, you know, uh, I've I've always just been friendly with, uh, you know, the team over there at WME, and you know, uh, and uh, we kind of went to them and we said, hey, we have this opportunity now where you know something about this is working, which is telling positive stories about founders, right? Talking about that arc, like for example, if you think about, uh, you know, Elon himself, like here's this guy who's an immigrant, right? Uh, it uh, comes from like not much, you know, moves from South Africa to here. Very, very interesting story. Lots of other founders. It's not like these people have inherited billions of dollars, right? Uh, or inherited things. They have built it from uh, scratch themselves. And there is a big audience for this, right? And not just here. Uh, like our biggest audience happens to be in India, right? Um, 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 because people there are like, wow, I love this story because I want to go be the next Elon. I want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Or, you know, I want to be, you know, uh, uh, BSS or, you know, any Indian founder. So, um, and we went to WME and I wish we could talk about it. We actually have a few projects in the works right now. And what we're trying to do is to do more of this right and that might mean say a documentary that might mean maybe a movie that might mean podcast but i think the idea is how can we talk about just people building things and look at company building and technology through an optimistic lens and you know the folks at wb are amazing uh and they set us up with a bunch of conversations and uh, we'll see so hopefully we can share more soon but that's kind of the story of how it all came but i, I know it's unsatisfying but a lot of no, these, great. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these things are just sort of accidental things, right? Like our show was accident, right? Like I had just joined A16Z, I think 
I was supposed to start the night after the day after I had Elon on and but the show took off and we were like, wow, we have this viral moment. Let's do something with it. And it just sometimes something you do resonates with an audience and you have to, you know, see how far it can go and we're trying to see how far it can go. Yeah, I love that. I love the optimistic lens on it and just having conversations with builders. I think the world needs a little more of that right now. Like the more like like at the end of the day, these are just people building to try to change change the world. Yeah, man, that's crazy. But I think it also speaks to just um, getting out there. Like literally, it's it, the theme is that you got it out there, whether it was writing or audio or podcasting, and just people picked it up and resonated yeah. with it, and then you run with it, and then it and it happens. Ten years ago, I there, I mean. GPs at VC funds weren't doing, I don't think, I mean, the, the, the poly work, I guess, would have been like, they sit on boards and maybe, you know, but I don't think they were, they weren't definitely weren't doing as much content creation, like brand building. They definitely weren't signed. You might be the first ever to be signed to a celebrity agency. How do you, how do you manage that? Like, how do you balance that? Your core is in Dresden, but you've got all this other stuff. I mean, documentaries, movies, we're yeah. going to see, like, how does that how do you think about that factoring back into the day and balancing it? So a few thoughts. First is, I would say in some ways, I credit Mark and Ben with this model. Uh, ben famously wrote Hard Things About Hard Things, which really took off, and uh, which is kind of like a good bit marketing vehicle for him in so many ways. And the firm uh, and the firm was one of the first to start blogging and to be really out there. Uh, in some ways, the VC world is interesting because we have the most commodity of products money right like you know there's a lot of places to go get money from and I, and I think you kind of have to stand out in this marketplace of ideas uh the phrase it, sometimes I would use is you need to be a bad signal for founders where yeah you know, like for example right uh, one of the things I'm really excited about these days is the transition from web 2 to web 3 and a lot of amazing people from who used to work in web 2 companies moving to web 3 and I you know trying to build web 2 products in the web 3 native way now unless I tweet about it or talk about it there could be somebody who's building something really amazing and they have no idea to send me a cold email right. say like hey I'm actually working on something and you should go check it out right so you have to kind of put yourself out there and you know um you know for people to go find you and I think the you know, and I think a full credit to Mark and Ben, they were one of the first to start uh, doing this. Now, I think you do hit on something which is very interesting, which is I'm very lucky. Like in my job, you know, like my work, both at the firm and all the stuff I do, quote unquote, on the side, they all tie together, right? So the firm, for example, is incredibly optimistic about technology, is incredibly optimistic about founders. We are not cynics. We are not skeptics, right? We believe in founders. I mean, you know, you can go back and read any one of like Mark's or, Ben's post. Uh, that's number one. The second part of it is like everything that I'm doing, you know, as some founder, if they Google me, they're like, well, okay, I kind of have a sense of like what she thinks about what he does. Um, and yeah. uh, being a founder and venture capital is such a long relationship. And if they know me a little bit better, right, that's probably, you know, means there's better chance of a relationship really uh, working out. So it all ties together, right? So at the end of the day, by the way, to be very clear, I, you know, the firm and, you know, I work for the firm so that I can make amazing investments. That's the core job, right? But outside of that, everything that I do ties in both with the culture of the firm, which is I'm optimistic about technology. I'm optimistic for those. The firm is incredibly optimistic. Second is it sort of helps, right? Because, you know, if I can, right. you know, if founders find a tweet or a post or a podcast, and because of that, they reach out to me and because of that, we wind up uh, making an investment, that's great too. So it all ties together. So if somebody here is listening to this, I would say you have to find a way to make it all tied together. I think the challenge that people run into is when they pull apart, right? Like uh, when you have something which your firm or your company totally fronts upon, it's against the culture of the firm or the ethos of the firm. Then I, that's when I think things get dicier and slightly more challenging. I'm very lucky though because I, uh, you know, I work in a place where I, and the things that I do outside all tie together. Yeah, I love that. It's something I I've been thinking about a lot too. With like, how do I like with this with the poly work trend and how do I do it? How do I balance time? And I mentioned it before when we first came, I was like, we're gonna get a host. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like, you, you of course you need to like talk to people about how they poly work. And I'm like, yeah, but how do I do that when I'm like hunting over here for product market fit and building features and experiments? But I mean, it would be different if this was, I think, a podcast about vegan food mm -hmm. and there was just like no tie to it. I, I don't know how to describe this, but there is a core that runs through all of the types of poly work that people end up doing. And occasionally you'll see just something like weird and wonderful. Like we, we have a Facebook engineer coming on the podcast in, in, a, in a while that like decides to work part-time in a bakery because they just, awesome. they love it. 
it's a passion project they want. And I think we will see, I think what's happening right now, the more, and I think you see it crypto too, is like crypto is a web three is a way for builders that have been at these companies. And that's why I'm like really into the IP topic at the moment, just because it was something that when I grew up with like being at Google 10 years ago, it was, it was really, we couldn't touch side projects. And it was something that I, and that's why I did the 20% project that led to like the entrepreneurial right. career and all this stuff. But I'm just really, I think right now what's happening is web three is a, is the canvas for a lot of this talent that's locked up in bigger tech companies that hasn't been able to, and they've almost like skipped the, like, well, if I'm part of this DAO, like, you know, does the IP thing matter or I'm contributing code to this? Or like, I think there's, we haven't quite got into that yet, but I think the thing that's most exciting about it is it's building its faster pierced and it's allowing them to use the skills that they built up in whether it was building web two consumer or working at like a B2B company in a fast paced environment with a bunch of creative people. And there's just no way that cannot help their energy and bring it back into the nine to five at Facebook or Microsoft or Google or wherever they're looking, wherever they're working, you know? Uh, absolutely. And I think the more companies kind of embrace that and, you know, like, kind of like find ways for people who kind of doing things outside to bring it back. And like, for example, if you're one of your engineers happens to have a podcast on the side, which is amazing, guess what? That person going to get seeked out when new talent, new engineers want to get hired, right? And if that exactly. gives you an edge in the hiring landscape, that, that is amazing. Uh, so I think you have to look at it as how do you sort of feed this back into the system um, and look at it as growth opportunities rather than trying to shut it down. And, you know, I, I, I suspect, uh, in some ways, I think crypto is really interesting because on crypto, I think there are two phenomena. One is I think it's so broadly culturally accepted that people work on multiple DAOs and contribute to multiple things at the same time. The second part of it is so many people are anon. So, you know, by definition, right. you actually don't know that what all the other things are. So it's kind of natively built into crypto and Web3 in a way which I think maybe the, the trad Web2 world or the trad employment landscape is just getting used to. It's one of the things I really enjoy about crypto, which is, uh, you know, uh, people who contribute to multiple DAOs or, you know, I run into, you know, I was talking to somebody who was anon and they told me who they really were. And I was like, wow, I would never have guessed that. And it's really interesting because the the job that they were doing versus you know the role that they had in this crypto project was so dramatically different. And I was like, wow, I'm so happy for you that you're able to kind of exercise a totally different skill set and crushing it. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Why was it why did they want to stay anon? Uh I would say a few reasons not to attract uh, attention. I also think it's kind of freeing to create a new identity for yourself in a different space uh, right. where uh, uh, and not be judged by who your employer is or you know uh, all the other things that you have to. Also, if you work for certain kinds of companies, there are probably strict rules on what you can and can't say. And if your right, name right. comes up, uh, you know, when somebody Google's a project, your employer is probably going to have a chat with you about that. So I do think like there's kind of like a, you know. It, if sort of a clean separation of identity and to avoid trouble, but I also think kind of it just lets them explore and have fun and you know keep their worlds so separate. So it's really built into the ethos of crypto, obviously, starting with Satoshi himself being uh, uh, anon. And I, 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 I suspect it's going to lead to more people in the regular corporate world having multiple jobs, probably working at the very same time. Yeah, I will. We're betting on that. Yeah. Okay. Last question. I know you're going to go for a couple more minutes. Um, they're very close to me. Advice for Web3 curious, Web2 consumer and founder folks. What would you say to them um, if, as they think about jumping in and exploring the Web3 space? Uh, people ask me this a lot. And I think, for, first of all, there's a lot of resources online which we can point you to. Like a 6 has a great crypto canon and there's a, we're working on some other resources and that's all amazing. But Web3 is as much a community as much as the technology platform. And I, I tell people, it's a little bit trying to describe, say, the country of India to someone. I can spend hours trying to describe India to you, but the you spending an hour in like a city right. on the street is going to give you like a thousand X more uh, input on what India is like, as opposed to me trying to describe uh, how it is like that. Web3 is a little bit similar. So I think if somebody's Web3 curious, I would say roll up your sleeves and just jump in. Join a DAO, join a few discords, see the language that people are using, you know, go buy an NFT, don't spend too much money, you know, just, you know, go play with it, go have fun, go make a few transactions, get familiar with sort of the core concepts. If you're technical, start writing some code, write some hello world, uh, uh, start, write some hello world code in Solidity. But I, I think a lot of people 
kind of look at it on the outside and a little bit intimidated. Um, and right. it is intimidating because there are so many different projects and people and the language and the community all feel a bit different. But it is amazing once you get into it and you're totally in. So I would say get started. And the second part is probably going to take a little bit of time. You're probably going to feel very lost when somebody mentions a new acronym or they mention a project that you haven't heard of because there's something new happening every single day. Trust me, it'll, it'll be fine. And there'll be a point in time where you like you know you feel part of the inside crowd. And that's going to be amazing. So I would say plunge in, get started. Doesn't matter where you start, go join a Discord, etc. Get started. And oh, I have to plug. So if you're anybody in Web2, you know, want, want to go to Web3, send me a DM. I would love talking to people about that. So you know, send me a DM, email, bat signal, smoke signal, whatever it is. I love to help. I love that. I did. Uh, it's funny. I, I appreciated you made a lot of intros to a lot of incredible like web three founders and I spent time with it. But what I will say also to folks listening is that it was, they were so positive and so willing to help and listen and let me ask questions, like stu the stupid questions. There was literally, I never at one point, even though I felt dumb, they never made me feel dumb. Um, I thought that, that was very different. I think there's a lot, it was, which is a crazy counter to how much skepticism there is around the space in general was that every conversation I had was like incredibly positive energy when it came to like speaking to web three founders, you worked at Twitter, you'd Elon on the show. Yep. Shit's getting weird. Elon and buying Twitter. What's your one minute on it? Thoughts? Uh, wow. Well, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know when this podcast is going to come out by the time it comes out, things might have really shifted. Uh, but yeah. okay, a few thoughts. Twitter is an amazing company and service. It has meant so much to me, both personally and professionally, and not just professionally because I work there, but professionally because I made so many contacts there. So I think it's a very valuable service and I want to see it do really well. I'm also a fan of Elon. I think he's capable of things that very few founders there. Uh, I'm very excited for this era. I think it's going to be new energy. Uh, I'm really, really excited. Uh, I do one thing I would love for Twitter to be over the long term, maybe under Elon. Uh, uh, is to be decentralized. And this might be the Web3 person speaking in me. The like Twitter is ultimately, uh, is, I think, is about the community. And I think Web3 gives Twitter a toolbox where the community can actually own Twitter. For example, you can open up Twitter and pick your client of choice. You can open right. up Twitter and pick your algorithm of choice. Maybe you get a say in the economics, maybe you get a say in the governance. And I think that should be the ultimate goal. But for the meantime, I think, you know, I'm very excited. It's definitely going to be very entertaining. What a guess. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the chat with, with Three Rooms. Always amazing to, to get into things with him. I think two of the things that stood out for me um, that were most exciting were one, you, everyone has to get themselves out there with content online. Um, amazing to see that Three Room attributes his writing um, and his tweeting um, in particular to where he is today. And so, yeah, if anything, it's got me excited about, I think, panning my first blog post potentially about my time at Polywork as a founder. Um, just got to build that, have that confidence to get out there and talk about it, which I think is great, great advice. Um, and then secondly, I think this is something we're navigating as a business too. And I think a lot of people, a lot of community members that I meet and spend time with are as well, which is, is it okay to Polywork? I think there is traditionally been this stigma around if anyone's doing anything outside their nine to five, they must be distracted or must need the money. And I think that um, in particular, just hopefully with this podcast and the platform and what we're doing and telling more successful stories about people that are polyworking that more and more of us feel encouraged to talk more openly about the quote unquote other stuff that we do. Um, I think that's really, really important and I'm glad we got to touch on it in today's conversation. Thanks for listening, everyone. Really appreciate it. And as usual, you can subscribe to our, our YouTube channel, hit us up on Twitter, our handles at polywork. And most importantly, check out polywork.com and you can sign up there if you're interested in joining communities, representing the different stuff that you do, and ultimately trying to navigate your way through learning the poly work. Thanks, folks.